Okay, Dovaran? Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, so welcome everybody. Last week we started with vegetarianism. We discussed that according to the different sources, Adam and Chava were certainly not allowed, Adam and Eve were certainly not allowed to kill animals. There are different opinions if they were allowed to eat an animal that had died without them killing it. So there are different opinions if they were actually vegetarians or not. After the flood, Noah is clearly told that now animals, the same way that they're allowed to eat fruits and vegetables, so too now they're allowed to eat animals. So there certainly is an allowance that comes about afterwards. When the Torah discusses us in the Midbar, in the desert, it speaks about when we enter Israel and in the desert, well, again, there are different opinions, but uh, once we're in Israel, we're allowed to eat according to ta'ava nafshecha, according to if one has a desire for it, one is allowed to have meat. So clearly, the Torah allows us to have meat within certain parameters, meaning which animals, and then how it is slaughtered, that it must be slaughtered properly with a knife without even the slightest nick in the knife, and therefore, um, well, it's interesting. We think of the word treif. We hear the word treif. What do we think of normally? You can't eat it. You can't eat it. It's not kosher. But actually, the, the root, and that's how it's colloquially used. It's torn. I'm sorry? Torn. torn. Yes, but actually, but, but the actual definition is taraf taraf yosef, that he, torn, yeah. right? Which means if the, if the animal is torn, and we take that, besides, of course, being torn apart by another animal or by a person, right? But even if there is, it is slaughtered with a knife that has the slightest nick in the knife, then instead of slicing, it's going to tear. And the shechita right, immediately kills that animal. In one, I, I, I've, I've watched a shechita, and literally in one stroke, both the esophagus and the trachea and I believe the, 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 one of the main arteries are all severed. Okay, so how do we view vegeta vegetarianism? And keeping in mind that sometimes, well, the, the Rambam says, the, the Beis Yosef asks about this, the, the, there's a Gemara that says, Ein simcha ela basar v'yayin. The only way to really enjoy a holiday is with meat, meat, and, meat wine. and wine. But actually, that's talking about the meat of a sacrifice. That's talking about in the time of, a tem of the temple. Nowadays, it's, it's not so clear that one needs the basar for, for that simcha. But certainly we have this concept of simcha with basar and yayin, with meat and wine. And on Yom Tov, on Shabbos, you have some meat, you have some basar, and that's what gives honor and makes it into a very serious meal. And, and we speak about, in all of our Musaf davenings, about how the Beit HaMikdash will be restored and the temple service will be restored, which includes, which includes animals as sacrifices. I, I, I say often that clearly the way we view animal sacrifices in our present world, uh, ourselves included, that we, we don't appreciate much spirituality in animal sacrifice, and it seems sort of gory to us. So clearly, along with the reinstitution of the sacrifices, there will need to be a, 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 a greater understanding, a reshifting of our view, our shifting of our view on it, to see the spirituality in it. Because I think most of us have difficulty seeing spirituality in, in um, animal sacrifice. What I want to do today is go through some sources, some very classic sources, some more contemporary sources of, of positive view on Jewish vegetarianism, and then I'd like to put it into perspective. Okay, 
So first we have from the Sefer, from the Kolba, Rav Yosef Albo, who was in the 14th century. 14th, uh, and well, 1380 to 1444, so the 14th and 15th century. And he says as follows, speaking about, I underlined the most relevant parts of that. So we'll read and we'll translate. al Kain Achar HaKarban, after the sacrifice that was brought by Noah, after he left the ark, Miyad God allowed immediately the, the killing of animals and consumption of animals. Ba'alim had said to them, like the, like, like the herbs of the field, I've given it all to you. Being that even, did I skip? Letzorach Adam, sorry. Even Cain understood that mankind domineered, had, had um, ascendancy over the vegetation and the fruits that they were created, Letzorach Adam, for the need of mankind. Cain kobal echayim in Letzorach Adam. So to all of the animal world was created for the needs of mankind. And man has this ascendancy over the animal kingdom because they don't have, there's not ruach echad l'kol. That's what we hear a lot from, the, from the, um, the, the very strong animal rights advocates. Right? Animals are people too. Right? That's not my own sentence. Right? Animals are people too. And we look at that, no, there is not ruach echad, there is not one spirit. There is not one, one soul. There is not one mission for all. And therefore the Torah then prohibits murder, saying that his Ruach is not like that of animals. Mankind was created in the image of God. He has this, this spiritual essence, this sura sikhlit, that is, that is above and beyond that of the animal kingdom. Skip down. But even that which is allowed, that is allowed for man's desires. What he calls the yetzer hara, literally the evil inclination. The chain, I'm skipping to the end of that line, Amr Chazal. When you have a desire of your heart, then you can eat the basar. Lamda Torah derech eretz lo yochad the basar, ella leteavon. Right. So therefore, the Torah is teaching us that the, the that a person should not eat meat unless he has that desire for it. We see that it was only that God needed to allow it for mankind. But it's not something to, um, to aspire to, we'll say. Rav Cook, who was in the early um, 20th century, the early 1900s, he is even more clearly and vocally in favor of it. And he writes, there is no doubt to every wise person who speaks with uh, understanding. When the Torah gives us this domination, and you will rule over the fish of the sea, over and the birds of the heaven, and all the animals that swarm on the land. We're not talking about a domination of this oppressive ruler. Who, who lords over his nation and his servants to fulfill his own needs, desires, and the wills of his heart. Chalila, heaven forbid, to attribute such a, an ugly type of domination that that should be forever stamped with the stamp in the world of God. Hatov l'kol, who is good to all. Barachamav al whose compassion extends to all of his creations. 
Shinimasa says, Olam Chesli Bane, the world was built on kindness. And besides the fact, and even more so, the Torah already already testified that there was a point of mankind that we lifted up to this lofty moral level. As Chazal explained in the Ketuvim Amchichim, Sha'adam Arishan Lohotu Lo Basar Lachila, that Adam, Adam and Eve were not allowed to eat meat. Again, that's not so clear. Clearly, they were not allowed to kill. According to some of the earlier authorities, they were not allowed to eat. According to others, they were not allowed to kill, but they were allowed to eat. At least following those that they were not allowed to eat. I've given you all of the trees that, uh, and their fruits and their produce to eat. Rock, but only the, 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 the children of Noah after the flood. That's when it was permitted for them. Like the vegetables of the field, I've given it all to you. Now, it's possible to imagine. It's possible that forever we lost this high moral approach. That, that, that already existed as part of the heritage of mankind. On such a thing, I would say, In the future, we, 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 our, our steps will be widened, so to speak, and we'll be able to go beyond this difficult, difficult conundrum of where we are supposed to be on this. But then he says on the second page. Rabbi, <laughs> yes. If we were meant, if the meat is meant to be for for con- consumption, then is a vegetarian going a a philosophy a denying that? Okay, so we're going to go into that. So we're, 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 that's an excellent point, Ida. We'll touch upon that soon. Right now we're saying that, that these authorities are viewing it as a lofty moral approach and concept. A highly sensitized approach. Let's hear what he says over here, and then we'll deal with your question. That's an excellent point you're bringing up. When the Torah allowed the eating of meat, after the holiness of the mitzvot were given at the time of the giving of the Torah, it was very lengthy in the different aspects of it. Van Martin said, you want to eat meat? Because you have a desire to eat basar. According to your desires, you can eat basar. There is a, a, a wise rebuke Nisteret, that is cloaked over here. Vahara gvulit, and there is a certain bordered, limited point that's being made. Kloma. As long as your inner moral compass is not revolted by eating the flesh of living animals, Kamoshikvar takats msar adam as now we are revolted by eating human meat, cannibalism. We find that revolting. So as long as the moral compass inside of you does not bring you to be revolted by eating the meat of animals as you are revolted by eating the flesh of a human being, that's what the Torah did not need to write explicitly, thou shalt not eat other human beings. Well, we're not kosher either. Huh? Who says we're not kosher? <clears throat> we don't short cut. We don't have huh? we We're not animals. Fish don't chew their cud. <laughs> but it says of the animals of the land, we're animals of the land. We're not animals. If you're on an island and it's only one person. Oh, one second. One second. <laughs> but let's, right? We're not animals. Fish don't chew their cud. Birds don't chew their cud. If it's an animal, it's a behemoth, it needs to chew its cut. Right? We, right we, 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 we would not have those restrictions. Right? But there's no need to prohibit it. Because it's, of course, it's a given. Right? Now, in a case 
that Ilan is bringing up, right? In a case of, of yeah, there are many cases, right? That um, that the only way to survive is to eat. So then, a person would be allowed to. What, to would be allowed to. Okay. Yeah, not to kill someone to eat, no. them, right? But if if someone else did not survive in uh, such a horrific situation, one, one would be allowed to do that. Okay. We don't need to be warned about something that, that, that innately we understand. It's as if it's written. So therefore, So when the time will come, literally the turn will come, for the matzav, the standing, hamusari, the moral, ethical standing of mankind, l'shaketz basar ba'alei chayim, to be revolted by the, the flesh of living creatures, then they had goal hamusari sheyeshba, because of that musar, that ethical um, re, re, revolt, revulsion that there is, then you won't have a desire to eat meat. And you won't eat. We learn from the yes, the no, and we infer from the no, the yes. So when you have a desire, you will eat meat. Well, when you don't have a desire, which Rav Cook sees as a moral height that mankind will come to, so when you won't have that desire, then... We infer you will not be eating meat. Lastly, the Beher Hetev, which is one of the commentators on Shulchan Aruch. Right? What he does is basically he draws from the other main commentators on Shulchan Aruch and gives a little bit of a synopsis. He writes, No again shlo basar velo yayin v'yom bet vehe. There were those who had the custom not to eat meat or drink wine on Mondays or Thursdays. Why? Just like the, 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 the earthly Batei Din Jewish courts would convene on Mondays and Thursdays, so too we have a tradition, a teaching, that the heavenly courts uh, convene on Mondays and Thursdays. And therefore it's not a day for us to be basar and yayin, Right, with, with meat and wine, somewhat frivolous enjoyment. The Kaimala we hold, the Yom, Gom Velayla, if you started already the day before, you can complete that night, even though the night's already the next day. Lachain, ain't ochen lel gimma velel vav, but you should not eat uh, the night of, uh, uh, of Tuesday, right? The night of Tuesday, because that's still, right, considered going back to Monday. Viesh ain't ochen lel bet velel hey. Interesting. He says, fortunate is the one who's, po- who's able to separate themselves from meat and wine. Kol ha-shavua, the entire week. Shekach nahag ha-arizal. That was the custom of the holy Arizal, who was the great Kabbalist uh, in Tzvat, the Ari HaKadosh. <laughs> Um, it would seem that, yeah, it would seem that fish is not such an issue. Okay, so we've seen some sources here that promote the idea of, from a moral, stand, moral standpoint, one should not want to eat meat. One should be somewhat, uh, find it somewhat uh, distasteful, we'll say. On the other hand, this is not the general consensus. The Gemara, the Talmud says that a person at the end of, 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 of the Yushalmi in the Tractate of Kedushin, it says at the end of one's life, one of the questions that God will ask is, did you enjoy every aspect of the world that I gave you? The Gemara says that, um, that it's a person that's not supposed to assume additional fasts. Because God gave us this world that we're supposed to utilize it. We're supposed to enjoy it. I like to compare it. You know, I, I walk over to your house with a big box. It's a gift for you. Oh, thank you so much. I come back three weeks later. I see the box isn't opened. 
It's sitting there next to the door. So how do I feel? Not, over, not overwhelmed uh, with the sense that, oh, I gave you this gift and it hasn't been opened. Right? Or it has been opened, so you saw what it was, but it's still in the plastic box. So you got to see what it was, but ah, no, thanks, but no thanks. Right? So certainly we're allowed to eat meat, providing that it was done in the proper way, slaughtered properly, etc., 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 right? And then blessings are recited. Certainly all that is allowed. Now, another, at the same time, also on our, on, on our, source, on our source sheet here, the Torah stresses compassion for animals. One of the seven Noahide mitzvot is the prohibition of Aver Menachai, not eating a limb torn from a live animal. And in general, we have this, this concept throughout the Torah of avoiding tsar bale chayim, avoiding a senseless, senseless pain to an animal. Now, there might be some pain to an animal. We, we minimize it with the way that we do our shechita, right? But there might be some pain, but we're not doing it to pain the animal. We're doing it in order to, to get food for consumption. We're allowed to use an, uh, an animal to plow, right? To carry loads. But we need to do it in a humane manner. We don't cook the kid in its mother's milk. That's that whole concept. Yeah. So I have a list over here, right? A, it's prohibited to cause pain to animals, Tsar Bale Chaim, that's the Talmud Bab Metziah. B, one is obligated to relieve an animal's suffering, even if it belongs to your enemy. Here, this is referring to there's a mitzvah that if someone is loading up a load and if someone else is unloading a load, so either way, there's a mitzvah to help them load, to help them unload, right? So in the time of the Torah, that was being done onto an animal. Right? Now we say that the mitzvah, if, if one person needs loading, the other person needs unloading, who do you help first? The unloader. The unloader right? Because that will unburden the animal. So let's do that first before we work on burdening the animal. And actually we mentioned the unloading, it mentions your enemy needs to have it unloaded. So therefore, right, in order to right, overlook your own personal grievances, and let's get this animal unloaded. C. If an animal depends on you for sustenance, it is forbidden to eat anything until feeding the animal first. D. We command a greater animals a day of rest on Shabbat. Jewish animals get to rest on Shabbat too. E. Forbidden to have two different species pull the same plow. This is unfair and it puts a lot of stress on the weaker animal. F. Mitzvah to send away a mother bird for taking her young. It is forbidden to kill a cow and a calf on the same day. Prohibited to sever and eat a limb of a live animal, one of the Noahide mitzvah that we mentioned before. G, um, is, is that for us or is that for, for the cow? Uh, you know, in, in other words... Okay, so both of them are true, right? Sending away the mother bird, also the Gemara discusses, <coughs> we are meant to show acts of compassion. As much as they do or don't understand it, if according to our understanding there is pain and suffering, then we become desensitized to pain and suffering, and therefore we are not allowed to do it. Shechita must be done with a minimum of pain to the animal. The blade must be meticulously examined to assure the most painless form of death possible. Right? Just one second. Hunting animals for sport is viewed with serious disapproval by the sages. Who was the known hunter? Asaf. Asaf was a known hunter. Yes, Jenny, want to say something? Regarding the bird and the mother, yes. I know you say not senseless. Well, um, I've heard people say that's such a rare mitzvah that if you get an opportunity in your lifetime to do that, you would just for the sake Correct. of Correct. But what if you weren't even going to eat the egg? Isn't that senseless? Though? So there are many different layers that are attributed to that mitzvah. Right? Some, some say that it's a very potent form of a plea to God, right? That when, you, when the mother cries about the children, 
who are being deserted, that is a very potent form of prayer to God. God, why aren't you crying about our plight, your children's plight? Come and save us. There are many layers that are there. Okay. So what do you do so, with the egg? I'd rather not get sidetracked. Okay. okay. So clearly, Judaism accepts the idea of being a vegetarian, but it really is dependent, the way we view it is it's dependent on one's intention, right? If it's that, well, you know, uh, I, I, have a, uh, I have an aversion to it. I don't feel comfortable with it. I don't think it's healthy. I don't think it's necessary. Fine. Right? And I put over here. If it's based on the idea that we have no moral right to kill animals, that, I would say, is not an acceptable Jewish view. We do have a right to kill animals. So to say that it's morally wrong, we have no moral right to kill animals, and unfortunately we actually see this happening in the world, that such an approach is not an elevation of animals, but it is a devaluation of a human being. Meaning, many of these radical animal rights people will kill someone who's wearing a fur coat. Right? Which means the animal's life is more valuable than that of the human being. So from a Jewish point of view, to lower us to the level of animals is to deny the divine spirit and the unique divine mission that is given to mankind. Right? And, and actually, someone sent me some articles. Right? And, and certainly there is a lot of, um, of abuse that is in the food production, animal food production market, right? Something that, you know, and they were talking about how, how they cause the, the cows um, um, to be pregnant in order to, in order to, in order to um, produce milk. I, I, mean, I had to add a little bit of a smile when, when, when they wrote that they, you know, artificially inseminate uh, the cows in a non-consensual manner. <laughs> now, I, I, mean, I doubt you know most cows actually do sign a waiver beforehand. You know, I mean, I mean, it's, to me that was again, you know, it's like th th this blurring of the lines between a human being right, and an animal, and and that's where and that's where it gets a little bit dangerous. There's, there's a teshuva. I'm sorry. No, yes. no, no. I, I read that Norway is now getting rid of all the fur farms. No more fur from Norway. But they also have a lot of anti-Semitism. <clears throat> so it's interesting. It's, you yes. hate, hate, on the other hand, people, but you protect the animals. So yeah. it's yes. like, yeah. uh, it's morally so inconsistent. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, 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 the Nazis, Yimach Shemam, would, would send Jews through a minefield in order to clear the field, but not, their, not animals, not their dogs. No, not their dogs. Hitler was a vegetarian. It's the same idea, and Hitler was a vegetarian. Yeah, I'm sorry? Hitler was a vegetarian. Vegetarian. Interesting. He was also happy, too. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's where the lines... Get, get very blurred. R R Rav Moshe, th 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 there was a whole stir about the way that veal was being raised. And they were in a, um, right, they were um, being raised in pens and unable oh, to move way. and not being given, given proper, proper food, right? And, and he writes there, besides all of the halachic kashrut issues that come up, Right? Because really we need to check an animal for all these different trefot, all these different aspects that might be wrong with the animal. We have a chazaka, we have an established principle that most animals don't have those problems, so we don't need to check all of them. That's glot, 
or non-glot meat, right? How many of those are actually checked and how much do we rely on a chazak? It could be kosher but not glot when it comes to the meat. But he says that when the animals are being raised in such precarious, um, unhealthy environments, you're losing that whole chazaka. You're losing that whole assumed status that everything else is functioning properly. But then he goes into the tsar bale chayim aspect, right? The pain that's being caused to animals, right? Yes, Ilana. So what about kapara? Why do they still do that? It seems like it's cruel. Okay, so uh, Ilan is referring to a custom that many have okay. that prior to Yom Kippur, there's a whole tefillah of we say that uh, many people use money, that's what I do, money, yeah. right? And we say this money should go to tzedakah, right? You know, and this should be my atonement and should go to tzedakah, right? Traditionally, birds were used and then those birds were slaughtered and given to the poor, right? So, I don't know, I, I don't think there's that much tsar to a bird to be held and waved over someone's head. There's, right? There's a misconception, I don't know where it came from, that chorus, you're actually grabbing the bird by the feet and swinging it violently around your head. It's not like that at all, if you've ever seen it. Or I've never yeah. seen it, but they did do it near my apartment in Queens, and I heard the screaming of the bird. Because they didn't do it right, that's why. Yeah, look, again, I don't think a bird is going to go nuts if I take it and wave it over my head. You're not right? I'm not sure what am I do on my head. Oh, really? Right. 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 We, uh, Rabbi Paris, when he was here, he did that yeah. here. Yeah, you yeah. That? So, you know, that's that's not, you know, this, I don't think it's Sarbal Yechem. Now, you know, a, a thought is my own personal thought, and I might be right or wrong, and, People are, are can agree or disagree. You know, but the animal's not getting to graze out on the farm. It's being more confined. You know, it's not getting enough, right? Uh, you know, there was a child who was having some some developmental. De 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 developmental issues. And someone said, oh, I feel so bad, you know, he's not getting to play with other kids, not getting to do all these things. And someone else said, I don't think he misses it. Meaning, that's not something that he's, that's in his, it's not something that he has been doing, he's been in the playground, and now he's not, right? That's just not in, in, his, in his world. That's not in his world, you know? And I wonder with this, how much of this we are putting on, like our, our view of the ideal life of the cow is going out to the nice green meadows, right, and munching along with my other cows, right, and then, you know, taking care of my needs and then going back to the barn at night. Right? Next day, it's back out to... Green Acres is the place to be. You know, I, I just don't know how much we are putting onto like the cows, right? Oh, that's that's an enjoyable life for a cow. Now, you know, a, a cow that hasn't had that, right? Is he? Oh, I can't believe I don't get to. I, I can't believe I'm missing out on all those. You know, I, I don't know just how much of that is really um, is really accurate, right? Certainly, we should not be causing pain to the animals. Yes, Ilana. I think we do humanize the animals sometimes. We try to think from a human perspective. But on the other hand, like if you go to these rescue, you know, places, parks, and you see like these big cats and they're in small cages and they've been rescued, um, it does seem kind of cruel. I mean, they have been rescued, but if they were used to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, how do we go with all of this? And what would Rav, Rav Kook say about what we say in Musaf? We speak about the temple being rebuilt. We speak about the carbonot, the sacrifices being reinstated. So what would he say there about, as he speaks about this moral compass reaching the point of being revolted by, by the same way that it's a given, we don't want to eat human flesh, that will, be, that will be revolted by the animal flesh. Yes? I suppose it's in the context of sanctification, 
information, we would feel uplifted and therefore want to eat. Okay. Okay. In those cases. Okay. So, so there's a very fascinating uh, teaching from Rav Chaim of Elijah. He, he was the, he was the, the, the great um, student of the Vilna Gon. He was the founder of the Velazhina Yeshiva, which was the prototype for all the modern day yeshiva that we have today in the world. They all worked off of that, that new concept of the Velazhina Yeshiva. Until then, every father taught his son. There wasn't this concept of sending a child off to, a, to an educational center. And he speaks there on his explanation on Mishnayot, on Pirke Avos. I believe on the Mishnah, which speaks about the three people eating together, and there's no Divrei Torah, it's if they're eating from Zivchei Meitim, is what he calls it. And he speaks there how the, the, well, we know Rashi speaks about the man was referred to as Lechem HaKolokel. The, the man was completely ingested into the body. There was no waste that came out. The man went in, didn't come out. That was one of the complaints the children of Israel had about it, that it was just a little, a little freaky for them. Okay? They called it the Lechem HaKolokel. That's how Rashi explains it in the Chumash there. He says that a carbon, when it was eaten, also was completely ingested by the body. Meaning, every aspect, the, the, the body takes out the good and eliminates the ra. Takes out the good and eliminates the waste. Our body does that choosing. Right? He says that only came about as a sin of the chait, of the ega, of, 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 of the marishon. Right? And that's what caused this whole mixture of good and bad and the need to separate. That's why he says the man which didn't come from the earth, but came from the heavens, was, did not have this mixture of Tov and Ra, and therefore it did not need to be separated. It was, it was completely ingested. And he says that a carbon also was completely ingested because any vestige of Ra was burned off and it became pure, holy food. An interesting concept. When I, I was studying with some of the younger kids in the congregation, and uh, carbonate came up, sacrifice came up. So one of the kids said, well, what did the animal do wrong? Now, you know, this person sinned, they're bringing a sacrifice. What did the animal do wrong? <laughs> Good question. And I said, maybe the question is, what did the animal do right? Meaning, if we're viewing this world, if we're viewing this world as, you know, who has, right, what moral right does a human being have to, to kill an animal, right? We're all just a bunch of animals. So we're a more sophisticated animal. But we're all just animals on this planet. And we're all just this fluke of nature, this improbable result of evolution. So we, with our more sophisticated evolutionary development, should have the moral understanding that we shouldn't take advantage of those that are less evolutionary, evolutionarily developed than we. And what gives us the right? Because we're no more important than a mosquito, or than a chicken, or than anything else. I mean, I wonder if you take that further, why are we more important than the, t the tomato or cucumber? What gives us the right to eat that? But whatever, right? Whatever. But, so, if our view is, and we're all going to live, and we're all going to die, and then it's all over, and there is no real spirituality, so I've got this crazy notion of, I've done something wrong, right? So what did the animal do wrong? Why should I bring a sacrifice of the animal? But the Torah point of view is, we're all sent to a physical world for a period of time in order to try to connect to spirituality. And the degree of spirituality that we connect to will determine our spiritual standing for all eternity after we leave this transient physical world. So there was a movie, All Dogs Go to Heaven. So from a Jewish point of view, no. 
All dogs don't go to heaven. <laughs> Do some dogs go to heaven? So I would imagine that any animal that helps humankind in their connection to spirituality, so they also have this aspect of spirituality that will give them, I would imagine, some degree of eternity. So here you've got an animal that instead of just going out from the barn, eating his hay, taking care of his needs, going back to the barn, next day out to the, out to the green pastures, eat my grass, take care of my needs, back to the barn, another day well spent, right? get some good shut-eye, next day, out we go, out we go. Right? So that animal is not affecting any spirituality. An animal that will be used for spirituality, because the carbon is not this voodoo, but it is this intense experience that one utilizes this animal as the proxy understanding that if I've rebelled against my creator, that should be my blood and my innards, etc., etc. And the person walks away and the person says, a vidoy, the ashamnu, the baganu, the confession. And the person walks away re, re-energized and rejuvenated, J-E-W, rejuvenated by the process. So then this animal has affected spirituality. So instead of just eating hay, pooping, and eating hay, and pooping, and that being the extent of its life, it has affected spirituality. Is that like a service dog? Right. I would agree. I would agree. Or not a service dog, right? A trusted friend of the family dog who becomes part of the family, who gives comfort. You know, my son tells me that, that, that when he comes home after a hard day, Chucky, uh, his, his wonderful chocolate lab, who we've had since a little puppy, he's, he's, an, he's, an, alt, he's, an, alt, he's an alta calib at this point, right? You know, but um, he senses that, and he knows, and he comes over, and he rubs against my son, and it helps calm him down, you know, and if the babies are, 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 are fretting and like that, so he knows, he doesn't need to go out for a walk. He'll be okay, you take care of the kids. You know, they, you know, so, so, you know, if an animal is, is helping in that respect and helping the, the, the spirituality, then I think yes. I think yes. So when it comes to a carbon, I think the question is not what did it do wrong, it's what did it do right. But it all depends on our outlook. And I think that really summarizes somewhat what we have over here. Vegetarianism, if I feel, you know, It's not that I'm not allowed to, the Torah allows it. It's not that the, that the animal is a person too, it's not a person. I, I've got a soul, and the animal was created to, to be here for me. But personally, right, it, it, it's, a living, it's a living being. You know, there, there, there's a story with this about Rav Cook. There's a story, the similar story with the Bubba Varebi. They're going for a walk with someone, and someone nonchalantly either pulled out a blade of grass or pulled a leaf off of the tree. And the Bubba Varebi and Rav Cook in separate instances, but a very similar story, turned to the person and said, why'd you do that? And there was no answer, oh, walking along, pull off a leaf, you know, you know. And he said, that's a living, that's a living thing. Right? Why should you terminate its life? Everything God creates is for His, is, is for the glory, for the beauty. Everything sings out its song of praise to God. Why did you sever it from its life source and not allow it to do that? Someone says, you know, personally, I, you know, I'm not saying, oh, you know, it's terrible that you eat meat. I, I'm, not, I'm not getting militant. I personally... I find it difficult. This, 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 was, this, was a living, this was a living thing, right? I, I prefer not to. Okay. That Rav Cook speaks about that, that being a, a certain sensitivity that once existed by Adam and Chava, again, according to some commentators, 
and hasn't been lost from us. And it's something that we would or could or, you know, or reclaim. Right? That's okay. But if it's, who am I to take? No. Who are you? You are a, and you are a creation of God who was put here with a unique mission and the world is here for you to gracefully, kindly utilize in your mission. And included in that is, is the consumption of animals, when done properly according to Allah, when done humanely according to the dictates of the Torah of Tzar Baalei Chaim. Yes, Iman. We really can't assume that just because someone takes on vegetarianism that they are doing it because they want, you know, because they have compassion for animals. They may do it because their doctor is telling them, you know, whatever, don't eat red meat or just eat plant-based foods. Look, 100%, no one should be judging anyone else. Yeah. This person is no, a vegetarian. I, I, I don't look down on them. I don't look up at them. I just let my wife know if they're coming Friday night, make sure you have enough, um, enough vegetarian dishes. But I, I, you know, I, in general, I don't think we should be looking at anyone and saying and judging what they're doing, why they're doing it.